Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so yes, so Tom, thank you for thank you for that introduction. And uh, yes, so Deep Tech Seed Fund is a fund, and uh, we do exactly what it says on the t on the tin. We are uh, very early stage funding for deep tech ventures. We are trying to be the first money in, so we are investing like with the very first investment round, what, what would normally be called pre-seed. Uh, we are two people. It's uh, me based in Dublin in Ireland, and my colleague Tom Bernice based in San Jose, California. And uh, Tom and I uh, successfully created a university spin-out venture previous to this, uh, which was based on a piece of uh, tech coming out of a university in Limerick in Ireland. And it was a semiconductor uh, related venture. It was to do with flash memory. And we had quite a smooth process uh, with that venture. We got in front of the major customers really early. We got an American investor in from the very beginning. Uh, like the whole thing went quite smoothly and ultimately we sold it to one of the semiconductor companies. And afterwards, we said, you know, and I've been involved in several startups before before that. So after that venture, Tom and I said, OK, well, actually, look, there's got to be an easier way. Like, why can't we, why can't it be as smooth for every other deep tech venture? Uh, and uh, so our original idea was to connect early stage tech in Europe with later stage funders in Silicon Valley, uh, because we had quite a good network from that last venture. We had quite a good network of uh, uh, VCs and corporate VCs. So we originally tried that. Uh, we originally we, we started off trying that, uh, but we quickly found that most of the later stage and specialist investors would not do really early stage. Um, they were interested in like high quality deep tech coming out of Europe, but uh, they would not do the, the very early stage. Um, and so can I just ask people to mute themselves? Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, so we said okay, well actually you know this idea works this having having this network uh, is a good idea the later stage funders are interested we just need a seed fund so we created our own seed fund and uh, we are uh, and we're addressing two problems that uh, we found from our last venture when we as a deep tech venture looking for money one problem was that investors would not talk to us because they did not understand the technology and the second uh, problem in speaking to investors like angel investors who did understand the technology is they were afraid to invest because they were concerned that our later stage funding rounds were going to be really big, bigger than they could uh, get involved with and they would be diluted too much. So our idea in dealing with uh, uh, deep tech that we do not understand is we only invest when there are interested early adopter customers. So where you've gone through a, a process like High Tech XL, or one of the other incubators in Europe, one of the very small number of incubators in Europe that does a really good job at connecting you with customers. We want to talk to ventures when the IP looks really interesting. So there's some you know cool technology that's been developed uh, and is deep. You know it's defensible, and where you are at the stage where there's a number of companies that are saying yes, this is really cool. You know, we need this technology because we know it doesn't exist anywhere else and we're willing to pay a little bit for it now. Um, <clears throat> that's that's the stage we're interested in and we can help a venture and uh, negotiate good deals with the right early adopters. Um, and, uh, uh, and we also encourage ventures to get as much grant funding as they can so that we're making a small investment to allow the venture basically to get started and have a and begin a relationship with, with with a commercial venture capital provider like ourselves so that later on when they're trying to raise really big money um, they can uh, you, you know they already have a relationship with a vc okay so so let me so that that's what we do now let me get straight into the presentation and um this audience today is a before and i kind of welcome i welcome it usually when i've been presenting um the almost all of the audience are scientists uh, and they're really not familiar with uh, you know investment and and all that sort of stuff today it's different i know that you guys are a mix and you know what i'm saying today is a little bit a little bit controversial it's a different sort of a, it's a different uh, it's a different view of the world than you will normally see uh, so i would really welcome questions at the end we've a lot of time for questions at the end the presentation might only take about 20 minutes and uh you know i would welcome people challenging what i'm saying or just generally asking uh, questions around it so please put questions into the chat uh or or you know just get ready to ask a question when, when we when we get to that stage uh, i'll go all the way I, I can take questions on the way but probably better if we do them probably better if we do them at the end so let me share my screen and we will get straight into it give me a moment Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, now, uh, and uh, sorry, Tom, could you just switch off the waiting room, please, so that people go straight in? It's really distracting when those little pop-ups come in. Just go to meeting settings and, and just allow everyone to bypass the lobby, please. Okay. <clears throat> So the central idea with our fund and our, our really strong advice to all early stage uh, deep tech ventures is to try and get a paying customer in some way. And I don't mean, you know, and, and I know half of you are immediately thinking, but, but we can't get paying customers because we don't have a product yet. That's not true. You know, if you have made a really significant breakthrough, uh, then normally there is a set of companies out there that will get excited enough about your breakthrough in the lab that they will be willing to pay for a proof of concept or otherwise actually make a, a financial commitment to you. And showing that you can actually get that financial commitment is one of the best things you can do uh, right now as an early stage company. And everything else, everything else comes from that, like following the money, uh, you know, showing that you can get customers and then developing in the direction that people are willing to pay money for is like the best thing you can do in my view. And our fund is set up on that. We are investing when that situation exists, even though the team might not be complete, even though the product might not be complete, even though a whole lot of other things are missing. And that's what we that's what we go for. So to explain why that's important and to kind of give you a sort of a 10,000 foot or 100,000 foot view of the world, here is uh, here is kind of how the world world of commerce and the world of capital markets uh, works. So, and I'm going to use this slide. And uh, apologies for the kind of crazy graphics, uh, but but let give me a moment to explain this. So along the bottom here, I'm showing the years. That this is the these are the uh, oops. Let me go back. Hold on, I'm going to use a give myself a little uh, <coughs> laser oh, highlighter that I want. Yes. <coughs> So, um, so along the bottom here, I'm showing the years uh, of development of your uh, of your venture. And let's say it starts back in research. You know, so so some of you are the people before you have been have been working researching this piece of intellectual property for a number of years, um, publicly funded. So the red here indicates uh, public money, so government money or European money. Um, so this this is how the venture has been funded up to now. And then at a certain point. Uh, you are getting into the, at a certain point, you're becoming a spin-out, you're becoming a, a startup. And uh, in theory, from the beginning of the startup phase, it's private money. Uh, you know, you're now commercial. Uh, so in theory, like, okay, so, you know, the, the capital markets, the real market is going to decide whether you are worthy of money or not uh, as a startup. And then later on, uh, you know, if you skip forward about at least 10 years typically, um, and, and I restart the clock, by the way, if you notice that at the spin out stage, I restart the clock because sometimes things can be in, in the lab for 20 years before they even hit, hit, hit the, uh, the, the commercial stage. But anyway, so, so about 10 years after it's become a startup, you know, all going well. Uh, and if you weren't acquired, hopefully for a lot of money, you could end up on the on the stock market. And it's very helpful to understand how the stock market works, because the way the stock market values companies ultimately is the way the same way as startups are valued. It just, it's the same process. It's not obviously the same process, but I'm going to, to explain how it is. And then when you understand that connection, you can begin to see how startups are valued and why it's important to get uh, revenue and so on. So that's why I'm kind of painting this, this big picture to begin with. So let's, let's sort of jump into this. So, so in an ideal world, you know, I'm not, and we do not exist in an ideal world as hopefully most of you have figured out by now in your lives. Um, <clears throat> In an ideal world, here is how it might work. Uh, now, the re my, what I show about research here, this is how it, this this pretty much is how it works in the research in the search world. Uh, you know, you apply for a grant, you get a bunch of grant uh, on on you know at the very beginning, and then over 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 a year or so, you spend all that money, and the money's gone, and then you say, well, we've made great progress, and I'm applying for a slightly bigger grant now. We're going to continue the work. And some people do that forever. You know, they stay in university and they get they just live on grants and post. You know. Uh, they're a postdoc forever or they're a tenured academic that's always getting grants to continue their work and that's fine but at a certain point you know where where we become interested and in, where hopefully you all got to before you came into high tech excel is you say actually we're going to do a spin out from this you know we're at this sort of spin out stage and uh okay so then we say uh 
uh, then in, a, in, in this ideal world, we get into the sort of grubby business of selling. And, you know, we have this uh, revenue line, you know, it's, it's sort of slightly faint line here, where we're actually selling something uh, that, that was uh, generated. And, you know, perhaps you don't start with revenue at the begin beginning, but pretty soon you start to sell and you start to increase the level of, of revenue that is, that is coming into the company. And then uh, as a result of this, the value of your company starts to go up. Uh, this, you know, so the the if anyone says, okay, well, how much is Nuco? Let's call it, you know, uh, Nuco Abe. Uh, like, how much is it worth? And it, but, and it's normally related to how much revenue you're doing. So the more revenue you you do, the uh, the um, so the more revenue you do, the more your the value of your company goes up. <clears throat> and then in this ideal world, you have exited the research phase. You you're saying, okay, we are this great company. We've got some great commercial prospects. And now we would like, um, uh, sorry, and now um, we would like to get some private investment because our venture justifies investment by private people because it's going to be worth a lot of money in the future. So some, so pr some private investors come along, give you a bunch of money, uh, you spend all that money, and then at the, when all that money is spent, oh look, your revenue is slightly higher. So yes, you've done very well. Now we'll give you even more private money. And so you raise a larger funding round and then you carry on doing that maybe two or three times until you hit profitability. And then, you know, you trade away for a while. And then at a certain point, maybe in the future, you say, OK, we're going to trade on that. We're going to list our company on the stock market. And then when you go to a stock market, uh, if you look at the way technology and sort of, you know, companies that are founded on intellectual property like pharmaceutical companies, the way they're valued is a multiple of their sales. And um, and, you know, it, uh, the, what the multiple is actually changes. So if you, so I've got this. It, there's a logarithmic scale on the left. If you hadn't, if you haven't noticed that already. Uh, so, um, so a company that is uh, actually I've forgotten what the what the multiple is. Oh yeah, no, I have it here. Uh, so, uh, so a company is is valued as a multiple of their sales, and a lot has changed. Well, things are changing in recent years because ever since the 2008 financial crash interest rates have been extremely low. So if you have a load of money that you need to put somewhere to actually get a return on it, almost the only place you can get a decent return now is in the stock market. And as interest rates stayed low, the price, excuse me, the price that people are willing to pay for companies has been going up all the time. So the ratio between actual sales, the, like the, the real, what is the real business of the company and the perceived value of the company has been, has been diverging. Uh, and if you look at this linear scale, basically been been it, it's doubled so the multiple of uh, you know the, the 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 multiple of what your sales need to be to achieve a certain company value uh, has has gone from uh, like the value of the company being twice the value of its sales to four times the value of its sales over the last 10 years so I'm just showing this and you say what is he on about like, what has this got to do with me and it, it has a huge amount to do with you because the point I'm making is that ultimately it is sales that cause your company to be valuable at all. Uh, and if we go away from our ideal scenario to the sort of uh, less ideal scenario, let's look at two, let's look at, sorry, uh, I lost my train of thought here. Now to, to bring this back to relevance to you, let's look at startup funding and how it works, okay? And I'll give you a sort of a two different scenarios. Uh, and uh, and they're, they're kind of, they're a little bit extreme. Well, no, no they're, they're not a little bit extreme, actually. This one is extreme, uh, and it's, it's, it's unusual. And this is the scenario where you fund your startup entirely with public funds, okay? And now, I know from talking to Hessel and some of the high-tech XL guys, this is less of an issue uh, in Holland that it is, than it is in other countries. But in various countries in Europe, there is very generous levels of public funding available for startups. There's also quite a lot of kind of publicly subsidized venture capital funds uh, which put in money really easily into early stage ventures. Um, now, uh, and you have, uh, you don't have that to quite the same degree in, uh, in, uh, in, sorry, in Holland. Uh, but I know that some of you are are from various countries, and certainly some of you could go to France or Germany or UK and you know have your com companies domicile there and get some of this easy money. But in the scenario where you get really, um, where you where you get uh, like. You, sorry, in the scenario where you fund your venture only from public funds, you are kind of creating a problem for yourself in the future. And it goes something like this. 
and uh, sorry, uh, so uh, and just to digress slightly, one of the reasons why why your funding strategy is particularly strategic and important for a deep tech venture more than it is for other ventures is that a lot of deep tech ventures um, will need a lot of venture capital before they have a final product. I mean, if you have a you know if you have a product, for example, in like if you have a new battery technology, um, then what you do in the lab doesn't really always translate into what happens in production. And it costs over 100 million of investment to get to a point where you have uh, a production line set up where you know that what you did in the lab is actually going to work at volume. And a lot of money has been lost by investors in battery ventures, you know, where they got too excited based on the early tech. So, so it's really important for you as a deep tech venture, if you are going to need large amounts of venture capital, that you you have access to it, and if you start with public money, um, then uh, you know it, it's dangerous because you you don't you, you haven't established any kind of credibility with the kind of people who can write the really big checks later on. So let, let, let me let me go away from that digression. So in this first scenario, <clears throat> you get a whole lot of grants, uh, and again, it's like the sort of in, you're you're like you're back in the research phase, and maybe you get grants from some of these, or maybe you get investment from one of the um, kind of venture capital funds that is uh, that has a mandate from from government like Dutch government or from a European investment fund to you know to invest early because they're saying well there's not enough private investors investing early we'll create something that looks like a private fund and we will give it money to make early stage investments a lot of those funds don't take an entirely commercial view of things they place money um, pretty much because they have to. And they, and at the beginning, they put a kind of notional value on a venture. So if you're a venture that's come along and you don't have good enough, um, if you if you don't have good enough um, revenue prospects, so you're not focused enough on sales revenue. So at the beginning here, you actually don't have sight of initial initial revenue for your, for your, for your venture. And you do succeed in raising money. Perhaps uh, you get a value of a, 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 a multi-million valuation for your company you get some of this early investment then you spend that money and if your commercial success if your commercial development hasn't been good enough then you're not going to look very attractive at the next stage maybe your existing investors will put in a little bit more money just to keep you alive but nobody else will and if another private investor comes along and look at looks at you they'll say no hold on a second we don't, we're not interested in this because we don't agree with that initial valuation. That was a crazy valuation. And we have better things to be doing than wasting our time talking to your existing investors and telling them why the valuation at your next round needs to be even lower. So you create a problem for yourself if you take public money at too high a valuation early on. All you end up with is a disappointed initial investor and you look very unattractive to the later stage investors. So don't be kind of, uh, but the key thing, now you could solve that problem uh, and sorry, that would not be a problem if you were, you know, sufficiently commercially focused, and actually this revenue number was going up, was going up well. Then, then, then it wouldn't matter. But very often, and, uh, and I mean, like very, very often, and this is a major reason why startup ventures uh, fail. They get the seed funding, and they they don't focus on the commercial stuff enough, and then they cannot raise any more money, and and they got the initial money. From investors that weren't sufficiently commercial and weren't being hard enough on them to say okay look you know you've got to make sure that that before we even put our money in that that you're all ready to kind of ramp up ramp up your revenue and so the guys get the money easily they go back into the lab they don't do enough commercial development and then when they run out of money they find actually the venture is no more attractive than it was you know after all of that work than it was at the beginning now that's sort of scenario one scenario two which to my mind is the ideal scenario is you have a mix of funding sources at the beginning. And ideally you have some revenue. So you have some early adopters who are willing to commit to you from the very beginning. So actually when you open the doors of the company or you know really get started, there are some early adopters, people paying for proof of concept. There is a, a set of uh, people willing to do business with you. And you, uh, you try to raise some private, you get some private money. So I'm showing here where the bulk of your money is, is coming from grants uh, or you know soft loans whatever it is but you get a private investor in for some money at the beginning because at the next stage the the public money um so so going 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 against what i said at the beginning just going right back to here uh, so uh, in reality in europe the public money does not stop at the spin out stage the governments of europe and the european commission recognize that actually 
there isn't enough there isn't enough venture capital active just here so they have created a whole bunch of funding instruments to provide some money here and and what i'm saying is that the trick is to take a mix so at this point the my ideal scenario is you get as much um you get as much public money as you can and but you get some private money uh, and so you're essentially establishing a relationship with the a private investor and the reason is that that's important is at your next round because at your next round when you're developed a little bit further on the public money kind of steps back and says okay well our work here is done you know uh, let the private guys now decide whether or not you merit further funding and it's much much easier to get that private funding if you already have a private investor on board partly because that private investor will also participate in your a round or your second c round or whatever it is but also because uh, in all likelihood your private investor, you know, through their participation on the board and so on, has helped you to to get ready for that that A round, and and then you know as you go on, you completely reduce your dependence on um, on um, uh, on public money. Now, in the middle of all this, as you'll have noticed, there is this healthy improvement in your in your revenue in your sales, and that is what allows the whole thing to work. Um, and you know, you don't need to be profitable. Like at the end of your first period of funding, you don't need to be profitable. You just need to show that this line is going up, that you have, you know, you have you have to successfully delivered the technical objectives. Maybe you've got the thing from a TRL four or five that was a, a paying for, people paying for proof of concept to a sort of higher TRL level where people are actually paying for product or paying, you know, advanced purchases or, or something like that. Uh, so as long as it's going in the right direction, you're absolutely fine. Now, uh, and, and all of this, what I'm showing here is only possible if you've got customer traction, and it's only possible if you've got customer traction even before you begin. Um, and the reason, you know, to kind of summarize all of this in, in, in one slide, um, and I'm kind of going, going uh, if I go from the, the bottom up here, the issue is that most of you are selling something kind of deep tech. And you know uh, now, and I know not all of you are. I know some of you have quite a straightforward proposition, but some of your propositions uh, involve, you, you know, quite a strategic commitment from your customers. You may be able to show them something in the lab that looks pretty cool, but for many of you, your product in earnest is actually going to be at the core of their product, and so they need to really trust the technology and trust you. And they don't do that overnight. It's not as if you, you, you can raise a lot of investment money. You know, develop your product into something super duper, and then expect to start selling. It doesn't work like that. the 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 companies that are buying like really cutting edge stuff, they typically uh, want to trust you. They want to see how it develops, and very often they also want to develop a little bit. You know, they want to influence your direction. You know, at the beginning, there's normally a lot of different directions you can go with with your with your technology. But it's it's very helpful to have the early adopters give you a steer to say, well, actually, we'd like your initial implementation, you know, to suit our use case. Um, and that that takes a long time. It also takes a long time to develop the trust of private investors. And if you are going to need, you know, 20, 10, 20, 30 million in, in one of your sort of A rounds or B rounds in order to actually allow your stuff to work at all, then you can't expect to, to, to go all the way along on public money and then suddenly arrive out to the private market and say, hey, I'm great now, now give me the 10 million. But I know you've never heard of me before, but I, I, yes, actually I need 10 million in order to, to go further. You know, it doesn't, that does not work well. So, so starting those relationships as early as you can uh, really makes your overall development much, much, more, much more smoothly. And so, the, so that's the kind of, the, the bottom half of the slide, the top. So, so in order to get there, um, now, as you are getting going through the high tech XL program and, you know, uh, getting ready to raise raise funds, ask for money from 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 customers. Don't get excited about letters of intent or, you know, people trying to be encouraging because they as they are, you know, you've got to be really careful about the sort of false signals. Everybody loves a startup, you know, aren't you fantastic? That's really clever what you've done. Well done. Of course, we'd love to support you, you know, ask them for money. Uh, you know, have a proposition ready to to a, a proposition for our proof of concept, uh, you know, or, or some other uh, trial engagement mechanism that they can pay for, and that's how you find out who is serious and who isn't. Uh, and then when and then when you come to the private investors, you know, you're not saying, um, hey, uh, give us money because we need it. You know, it's give us money because if you give us money, then these customers can pay us money. You know, it's like 
you know, you're 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 trying to expand your restaurant, uh, and the reason is because there's a really long queue outside your restaurant every night. Like it's really clear that it's worth loaning you money to to expand your restaurant. That that that's where you need to be to be really successful with private investors, and then also get as much free money as you can, so that so that the amount you're asking for at the very beginning from the private investors is as small as possible, and then you can get the best investors. You know, you have an you have an easy proposition. You will have your choice of investors. If you have a very strong, if you have evidence of strong demand, and you're asking for a small amount of money, that's the perfect situation. And then you can choose which investors you want uh, to deal with. So that is it. Now, uh, that that's my presentation. I would just point you to, to two things. So many of you will be saying that's all fine. You know, how do we actually get these early adopters? And uh, there's a document I've done, which is like a, a mini proposal. It's it's. It's kind of how to ask for uh, early adopter money, and there's a link to it there. And there's also a much longer presentation I've given, which is like about the mechanics of asking for uh, asking for money from early adopters. You can see that at that link as well. Uh, but but that's it. And I, I would really welcome the opportunity to take your questions and uh, and take your questions. And I'm happy to take the questions in the context of your specific venture. If you want to tell me, you know, a couple of sentences, I can sort of try to relate what I say to your uh, situation. So that's it. Yes, so thank you, uh, Piers, uh, for the presentation. I see that Alexandre has put up his uh, hand, so maybe he can kick off the, the questions. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Um, thank you, Mr. Coyle, for that very insightful presentation. Yeah, Piers, um, which, Okay, excellent, Piers. <laughs> uh, my question is uh, relatively simple. So I think seed funding is always great. Uh, smart money is even better. So I guess I was curious, uh, you know, I was looking at your website and I, as I understand it, there's two of you, um, you know, in addition to the seed funding, how, how involved do you get with the startups you, uh, you work with uh, in terms of sharing your serial entrepreneurial expertise? Uh, so we get involved a little bit, uh, Alexander, and uh, just tell me, what is your venture, by the way? Yeah, so we're working on a, basically a pulse power conditioner for uh, with potential applications uh, across a variety of fields. But basically, we improve the stability of the electrical pulses, the repeatability. Uh, we provide pulse to pulse modulation in terms of amplitude and waveform uh, and all that with high voltage applications and rapid switching. So in terms of sectors, we're looking at uh, medical particle accelerators, uh, pulse electric fields for food processing. Uh, space is relatively large. Okay, cool. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so so uh, we don't. The answer is uh, Alexander. We don't get involved a huge amount. We, uh, you know, there's a number of different. Uh, we, we don't get involved a huge amount. I will tell you how much we get involved in a moment. But there's a number of different approaches to, uh, you know, to supporting early stage ventures. And uh, and you know, so for example, with High Tech XL, I think the bulk of the investment is in kind. Um, and, you know, I have done that before. I've done kind of in-kind uh, support uh, alongside, you know, angel money and stuff in, into ventures. And, um, uh, but it doesn't scale. So what, what we do is we focus on a couple of things. We focus on making sure that the conditions are right uh, for the funding round before, uh, before we put our money in. And specifically, I mean, uh, we, we make sure the companies are raising the right amount of money or you know, we advise them on in, in the right amount of money to, to raise to, to, to meet the objectives that will allow them to get to a stage where they can where they can successfully raise the next next amount of money. So we are quite active with them in you know, advising on cash flow management and things like that. We also advise uh, on how to do the appropriate deals with the early adopters. Um, and that's quite important. Uh, or if they're spinning out of a university or spinning out of a company, we advise them and somewhat represent them uh, to get the right deal with the uh, organization that they're spinning out from. And the first deal we did actually was we did a huge amount of work with uh, on that. It was a spin out from from Sony Mobile in Sweden. Um, uh, so we kind of do a lot of work. Things set well. And then after that, all we do is we're, we, we take a board seat. Uh, we advise when required. We're not interfering. And we don't, you know, we're not kind of, uh, we're not becoming interim managers or anything like that. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does, and, and I think that's unfortunate for us because uh, just based on your presentation, I think you have a lot, to, a lot of expertise <laughs> to share. Yeah, no, I um, mean, and, and like, 
it's an interesting like it's an interesting one i've thought i've thought about that because as i say i've done like in the past i've done a bunch of uh, ventures kind of one at a time you know and i've sometimes i started off an advisor and I end up full time so i'm determined not to do this this time because like our, our our financial offer is quite unique and uh, we're we're intent on getting that out to as many people as we can and guys uh, sorry and, and sorry guys turn on your camera if you're asking a question please <laughs> yes that's a good one. Hans, uh, I see that you have raised your hand. Could you please turn off your camera and uh, ask your question? Yeah. But my camera, it's in the dark. Hey, Piers, my that's camera is <laughs> working in the dark, not really that well. So that's okay, Hans, that's okay. You see, you see my glasses. <laughs> I can go. see your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned that it takes years to get. Okay, uh, I'm working with Teruka. We are developing a structural health monitoring solution for wind turbine blades to save the wind industry billions in operations and maintenance costs. Um, you say it takes years to build up the trust. Um, how can you do that faster? Yeah. We don't have the years. We don't want to spend, yeah. we don't want to wait the years. <laughs> well, okay, so what I mean is, I don't mean it takes years to get the proof of concept deal. Uh, what I mean is, um, uh, okay, so what I mean is, if, if your venture, uh, if your product um, is going to be really critical to the operation for something. And by the way, we don't. Now, now I know you're not life. I know you're not life sciences, but I forgot to say we don't do life sciences. Now I can give an opinion, but we just generally don't do life sciences. And um, uh, now, so Hans, it's not a problem because you know all you need to do to get started is like a number of proofs of concept, uh, evidence of a wider market, you know, evidence that you guys can get your act together, and like. You know, and then you you you're you're raising money typically for eighteen months at a time. Uh, if you have a set of early adopters that are interested, and one or two of them that are willing to do a trial with you, uh, then that doesn't take years. What takes years, what 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 can take years is you know if you are going to be putting a component into the uh, what's that name for the wind turbine, the, the bit at the top, the um, nacelle. Yeah, the nacelle, exactly. So if you were going to be putting something into the nacelle that had the potential to make the whole thing come crashing down and kill some people, uh, then they would not take that from you quickly. You know, they would need a, they would they would need a lot of uh, trialing on uh, 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 trialing before that, that that would come in. But you have that much time. I mean, normally, you know, you just need to evidence evidence of interest and uh, and get the thing started. If your product is not in that position, and I, and I think. Uh, I think I've seen. I think I've read about your your uh, venture. I don't think yours is like that, so it shouldn't take years. Mm. Okay. Okay. So we should be. We shouldn't. We shouldn't aim for years. We should aim for shorter. Well, you know, it may take years before like a really large operator of wind turbines uses your technology across their whole state. Uh, mm. But that's not. You know. But that's okay. okay. You you've got you you can wait years for that. Okay. okay. We will start asking for money. Well, in any case, define how we can create a product that we can ask for money for. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 like and in relation to that, I mean, I'm not expecting you all to go off and read my 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 other document, but essentially, um, let me explain it a little bit. Um, if you are if you are saying to investors or to the high tech high tech XL or whoever that there's going to be this huge market for my product, you know, I've got this new technology. And there's going to be this huge market for it. Then, ah, Hans, I can see, I can see yeah. you. Here he is. There he is. It's the it's the light of the mic of the the uh, telephone that I use as an. Uh, I was beginning to think you were a bot, but anyway, now we know. So, it, so if you imagine any um, any market, uh, you know, it normally have a bell curve type shape. So it begins somewhere like down the bottom. It grows. You have all the people talk about the early adopter phase. The you know the early majority all this kind of stuff then there's this great big market and then you know eventually it, it tails off so if you're saying that at some point in time there's going to be this super big big market for my amazing technology then if that is true then there is probably sorry if, if that is true then there is certainly some little group here at the beginning um you know they've been waiting for this they've been waiting for whatever development you, you have and you need to find those guys, find that use case where the need is urgent. And those people will say, oh, that's fantastic. I've been waiting for this. You know, I can see your results from the lab. You know, I've seen your demonstration. Yes, I realize it's not a complete product yet, but I want to have this first. 
you know, and those people will engage with you very actively and probably will, will, will pay you if you put it to them correctly. So that's what you've got to understand that if, if you can't find, and this is central to our investment thesis, if, um, uh, oh yes, I will add those links in the chat. Uh, if you can't find, um, um, yes, if you can't find anybody who needs it urgently now, then it's very difficult to claim that there is going to be this huge market later on. So that, that's that's my idea. So now keep asking questions there. I'm just going to put those links in the chat. Yes, so, but nobody else uh, has raised its hand. So just, yeah, I see Alexandra again. And after that, uh, Charlotte. Yeah, sorry, sorry to be persistent, but I figure okay. I might as well take the opportunity. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, our, our product is uh, maybe a little bit particular relative to the rest of, of our cohort in the sense that it's a subcomponent. So we're kind of removed from an end, or at least a clear end use impact. Right. And I was wondering if you had any maybe tips on, you know, what's, what's, deep tech companies that are working with those kinds of subcomponents should and shouldn't do in terms yeah. of, uh, you know, uh, I guess, stakeholder relationship development, maybe. Uh, yeah, no, I, have a, I have quite a clear view on this um, because, you know, my last venture was like that. Like we were we were providing uh, a piece of IP basically to the to the flash memory makers. Now, we weren't going to set up a semiconductor fab and, you know, make our own uh, flash memory. So uh, we were being looked at as a as a kind of a pure sort of IP acquisition almost from from the very beginning. So there's a couple of things. Um, the only the the thing that makes you most valuable. So so and sorry and many um, many deep tech ventures are like that. Um, you know you are essentially uh, you you've got a new a new component. You've got a, you've almost you're almost a feature, not a product, and that 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 is challenging. So um, realistically, the best use case for most technologies like that is to be acquired by, excuse me, is to be acquired by a very large company that has the kind of infrastructure that they can use your, your IP. And, uh, and very often the early interest or the earliest interest you can get will be from companies uh, that are in that, in that position. But the challenge is that there are many, uh, many areas of industry, but there's a very small number of companies actually dominating it. So, you know, uh, you know, like for, going back to my memory example, there's actually only four companies in the world that make memory. Uh, there's two, two of them are joint ventures, so it looks like six companies. And, you know, if you look at, if you had something related to, you know, CPUs, uh, computer CPUs, like there's, there's an even smaller number of, of companies that are significantly involved in that. And it's the same in, in, a, in a few other sectors. So what you end up with is a situation where you have your component technology and uh, you may be engaged with some of those large companies. and you know, the realistic business model for them is going to be a sort of an outright purchase or a licensing or some, something like that. Uh, uh, and and they are the ones who are going to pay the most for, for your technology. It is the most valuable uh, to them. But I, I think the trick is, and this is something we didn't do in our last venture, and I've seen it done, uh, I've seen it done more successfully by others since. Um, if you can also find uh, if, if you can also find a situation where you can create an almost complete product, uh, where you have some small player in the market uh, that can use your technology and integrate it into a complete product or can license that product to you so that you, you actually have a line of business where you are bringing your technology to market in some way, uh, or you are helping one of the sort of not mainstream players to succeed. And so the big guys can see, wow, look how successful those guys are because they have access to this unique technology. Uh, so I think the ideal mix is that you are dealing with the really big people for, for whom you're just a component, but you also have some way to deliver a subsystem or a, a system that uses your technology so that you can actually begin trading. Uh, and, and like, you know, the, the really big guys might be saying, well, you know, we won't really use your technology until the next generation of our equipment, you know, which is it's on a sort of four year cycle. So, yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll design you in and, you know, you won't. So you don't you don't end up with anything deployed. And if you don't have something deployed and you're not really generating revenue from deployed stuff, it is it, it, it looks much more risky and a lot less will be paid for you and for your product than if you can actually get something deployed 
and it's really working out there because then the, the the sort of leap of faith they have to make to pay you know many millions or tens of millions for your company it's a much smaller leap of faith because it's really proven so i mean so that's my advice alexander you know like you know work to the big guys that are just interested in your component but try and find a way to get a sort of a functioning uh, system or subsystem that uses your com your component as well does that answer your question Yes, it does. Thank you, Pierce. Thank you. Shalom. Thank you. Raise your hand. Uh, and you're muted, Charlotte. I'm on the music. Thank you. Hi, Pierce. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, really great uh, presentation so far. It's really uh, interesting. Um, um, we are developing a hand controller with haptic feedback. Uh, for the rehab industry and it's supposed to um, uh, make um, um, rehab more fun and uh, also um, give qualitative feedback to the patients and the physical therapists. Um, and I was interested in uh, what do you mean with um, your testing in uh, life sciences? Um, maybe you can elaborate a little bit about that. And the other thing is, are you familiar with our uh, product or with our startup? And uh, would you have any advice for us? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so first of all, uh, so the reason we don't do so we don't do life science, and the reason we don't do life sciences is, is just because it it's most things are very different. Uh, most sectors are regulated, and. Uh, there is quite a different uh, commercial life cycle to regulated companies than than to companies that are in the sort of pure tech and commercial space. You know, your your uh, like your sort of A and B and C rounds. Your your funding cycle is very much dominated by the stages of regulation, and it's not a, it's not something we understand. We don't want to be kind of wasting entrepreneurs' time by giving you know advice from a from a position of not not knowing knowing the stuff. Um, so, so that's what we mean. And, and no, I've not seen your, your venture. I am aware that, that you're out there. Actually, it was mentioned to me by another high tech Excel startup this morning, but I, uh, I, I didn't look at it because you weren't because you are clearly life sciences. Um, uh, a lot of what I say though still applies. I mean, you know, you still need early adopters. Uh, you know, you you still need you know I don't know a, a population of people who are, who can corroborate the benefits of your of, of what you're doing. To justify, you know, the expense of going through regulations or whatever. So the the same principles still apply generally. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Hey, Tana. Then I see that you have raised your hand again. Yes. Um. You know, as you said, uh, since you say you're not interested in life sciences, uh, it's a little bit um, less interesting for us. But I still think it's been a useful, uh, a useful workshop for us to understand how to approach this process of fundraising. Um, my company is Nestegg Biotech, and we uh, perform lab automation. So it's uh, somewhat of a hybrid, uh, high tech and uh, life tech or a, a life sciences type of company. Um, Although I, I did look at your document and I think it's very helpful uh, type of thing to send around since we already have a, a beta version of our system. My question was specifically, uh, if you have letters of intent, you have interested testing customers, um, or is it, I understand you say it's better to have paying customers, but if you get, let's say an order book uh, of, of actual orders for systems to produce, is that also uh, useful when going to investors? <clears throat> Uh, yes, it is. Uh, now, now, uh, and uh, yes, it is. Uh, and like, I'm not, I'm not totally hung up on the paying customers. I mean, if the, if the other, if the, if the kind of order book type customers can be very clear as to what are their prerequisites before they place the order, and it seems like you have an achievable technical goal that is going to allow that to happen, then that's pretty much as good. I mean, because like what, and and in contrast, what is no good is like a a paying, uh, you know, a paid engagement from some insignificant company that is not going to really buy your product in volume. So, so I'm normally looking at, I mean, asking for the money is really, asking for the money is really healthy because normally, uh, like it's almost an exercise uh, because if you, uh, like you can talk to a fellow scientist in the company and they can get really excited about your science and they think it's wonderful. You know, it says, 
you know, Phillips on their badge or something like that. That, that sounds great. But if you ask them for 10,000 euro or 20,000 euro for a paid proof of concept, then a whole bunch of people in that company need to get involved. You know, and somebody who actually controls money needs to say yes. And that proves that it is not just uh, your friend or your cousin uh, in, in the company. It is actually the company. And, um, uh, and, 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 then, and then also, you know, if as an investor, and I've had several of these conversations, you know, I, I speak to the company and I'm saying, hey, look, you're doing this trial. What's your intent afterwards? And like, it's all about a person with the right authority being able to tell the investor that, yes, you know, this is quite strategic for us. We have like 24 labs in three countries and we will see ourselves, you know, implementing this in two of them straight away as soon as he can do X, Y, Z, you know. Uh, so it's it's that level of like it, it so so ideally you have the financial commitment now but also you have the person the senior person who can tell the investor what their plan is for your for using your technology and ideally both but if you if you can get uh, at least the second one uh actually the second one is more important really thank you very much and i'm impressed um, your your signal quality from a an electrical train is very impressive <laughs> I'm uh, tethering to my phone. I wouldn't uh, wouldn't put you through the the, the uh, train Wi-Fi connection. No, even still, it's uh, still it's coming over wireless network uh, with a huge electrical field around it. Anyway, okay. <laughs> hey, thanks, Tana. Then uh, see Leon uh, put his hands up. Yeah. So hi, Piers. Um, hey, Leon. I'm also from uh, Tarbuka. Uh, so Hans already explained the company, so I don't have to do that. Also, I think. Uh, my question is a little bit about, uh, okay, if you want to go with um, um, with a proposal to a customer, do you then immediately tell him the end product, like what you will try to get in three years? Or do you normally start with, well, we are building the proof of concept and the proof of concept will take us half a year. How do you normally relate in that field? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, so you can't talk about the end product. I mean, it will be very obvious to the customer that to the company that you're speaking to that you're a startup and that you don't have a finished product yet. So there's no point in in trying to pretend that you have one or even talking about the sort of two or three year, you know, what, what you will have in two or three years. I would say what you focus on is what you focus on is what problem your intellectual property can uniquely solve for that for that uh, for that person. And sorry, remind me what remind me what the business is. Yeah, so we are making a structural health monitoring tool for wind turbine blades. For for what? What was that? For what? It's turbine blades. Oh yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Okay, so and I've seen and I've seen pictures, you know, a few a few pictures like this, you know. So like, I'm assuming that you, like most of the high tech XL uh, ventures, you have some piece of intellectual property that is enabling your product, mm -hmm. and it is uniquely enabling it in some way. So what what you are saying. You know what, you, what your pitch to those guys is that you know you uniquely can solve a problem that you believe they have and, and that that's the point so you know as a result of four years work in cern or wherever the hell it is you know you have a set of algorithms that uniquely allow them this to happen and that you're now at the stage where uh you're now at the stage where you're proposing to get investment of you know half a million or a million to take it to the next stage uh, and so somebody else's money is going to bring this further. So you're speaking to, you know, a major wind farm operator um, and you're saying to them that, look, uh, you know, we, we are trying to prioritize uh, which early adopter customers we are using. You know, our initial implementation will be particularly well suited to the uh, circumstances of our early adopter customers. We're going to spend a whole bunch of somebody else's money to do that. And we just need a small amount of your money to allow you to be almost one of the first to get the benefit of this. So, so that's it. So, you know, you have a unique pitch, uh, you're looking for a very small commitment. They will get a lot more value than they're paying for, uh, but you need their value in order to do that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the explanation. Okay. Yes, thank you, Leon. Uh, Ian, I see that you have raised your hand now. Hi, hello there, Pierce. I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear and see you. Oh, good, good, good. Hi, um, my name's Ian. I'm um, I'm with Udentity, which is uh, um, looking to exploit a thin film uh, imaging array technology coming from TNO. Um, 
going towards the biometrics markets and uh, we see a huge opportunity there for a new class of, of biometric sensor, which is inherently secure. Um, really, thank you for your, your presentation, by the way. It was um, illuminating. And, and um, I'd, I'd like to, if I could, ask you a little bit more about you and, and what your fund is um, about about your fund, what, what yeah. kind of portfolio? You, excuse me. What kind of portfolio are you looking to build? What are your your fund life cycles like, and your LPs and <clears throat> investors that you have? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I'll take them in the order that I remember them, which may not be the order they were asked, and you can top up if I missed uh, some of them. Uh, so the LPs are a group of tech entrepreneurs that have made a lot of money uh, from one particular tech venture. So it's the, it's the principles of that venture have basically put money into into our fund. We have access to about 70 million. Uh, our fund uh, strategy, excuse me, our fund, funding strategy is to um, to paraphrase Star Trek a little bit, to boldly go where no one has gone before, which is into this kind of really early stage. So we are uh, operating on the, you know, possibly delusional idea that we have a very good understanding of the commercials of, of early stage ventures. So we are investing based on a single data point, and the single data point is that there is strong commercial interest now. You know, the technology could still fail. Uh, the company might never succeed in getting a really good commercial CEO, or might never succeed in getting a really good commercial person. Uh, like there's a whole bunch of things that could still go wrong, but our view is that if there is good demand now, uh, uh, you know, at the very beginning, then that is a very good predictor of future success. So we are making small bets. Our our strategy is to place a small amount of money at the beginning, uh, just enough to uh, ideally lead the round, uh, and lead the round with just enough money to allow the entrepreneur to get enough money to go to the next stage. So very often, if we're putting in just 50 or 100K, a venture can get nearly half a million through grants and loans and matching investors and so on. So, so we are making a small bet, and then our strategy is to follow our money through the next few rounds and probably increase our commitment. Uh, so we are a multi-stage investor, um, and we are also strongly connected with a group of later stage investors. So before we invest, we try to sound out later stage investors who are specialists uh, so that both we and the venture know that uh, we have access to the appropriate kind of specialist or appropriate kind of deep pocketed investors later on. Um, uh, so me personally, I have uh, been, I mean, I started as a techie computer science graduate years ago, and I worked as a techie for a number of years, and I moved into sales. So I kind of, I went from the sort of technical side to the commercial side, and, and I work, I ended up of uh, 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 Irish companies that had their own technology that were selling it around the world. So the, the concept of, this is the piece of tech. Where do I go to find the market? That's the kind of a, a challenge I've met sort of a couple of times as an employee, then multiple times as an advisor or investor. Uh, I did a series of kind of uh, small investment, join a company, intro management type things fairly successfully. And then my intent this time is to sort of scale that up, get a fund, do it a whole bunch of times. And, you know, I have a very clear view. Uh, I have a very clear view on how the, the process works. And I'm trying to bring to bear my experience and my colleague Tom is a similar sort of track record. Uh, uh, you know, I think there's a set of things that people can do at the very beginning that is going to be really uh, not just predictive, but instructive or, or it, sorry, there's a set of things you can do at the very beginning when you're just getting started when you're doing your first funding that have a huge impact on your likelihood of success. And our, and our, our idea is to put, put, create those circumstances with our money for a bunch of companies. That's, that's the idea. Okay, really interesting. Yeah. Uh, did I get to all your questions? Uh, I think you did, and yeah, I, I, I'm uh, I'm just wishing we had somebody like you last time around that did this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Is there anybody else who uh, would like to ask uh, Pierce a question? I don't see any hands raised anymore. Well, it's uh, nicely within the time. Uh, well, look, yeah. I mean. I, uh, 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 you can reach out to me through Hessel or, or you know, otherwise. Uh, I think my email address was on those slides. Uh, you know, I'm happy to take. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. I, I like the High Tech Excel program. I think you know you're 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 lucky to be in a really good program, um, and I'm happy to invest time. You know, I, I'll take questions from me individually if I'm not particularly interested in in your venture. I'm trying to build a good relationship with the High Tech Excel guys. Uh, so, you know, and I, I appreciate the good, really good questions today, and I appreciate the, the opportunity from Hessel and from Tom for allowing me to pitch to you guys today. 
Yes, and you uh, thank you, Piers, for this uh, presentation. I really liked it a lot, and I also liked uh, the interaction afterwards. Uh, a lot of good questions were asked. So uh, I think uh, this is it for now. Please uh, reach out to Piers if you would like to ask him uh, any other questions. You can uh, either reach directly out, uh, reach out directly to him, or of course uh, through me, and I would just forward the question. Uh, and I'll have a great weekend. Okay, guys. Thank you. Hey, bye. Take care. Thanks, Piers. Thanks, Piers. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks, Piers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.